Okay. Well, it's good to see all of you here. So do afterwards introduce yourselves around because a lot of you don't know each other. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Well, today I want us to talk now about a subject that can absolutely, completely change the direction of your life. It can absolutely change the direction. Now, this knowledge, if we use it, is a power weapon. It's a spiritual power weapon. Now, Ephesians 1.19 talks of the, about the surpassing greatness of God's power that's given to all of us who believe. And we read right past that, and we don't really pay that much attention to what it's saying. But listen to this. It talks of the surpassing greatness of God's power that's been given to us. God gave us the surpassing power of his greatness. Now, there are so many Christians who don't even know that this is available to them. You know, I talk to a lot of Christians different places, and they don't even know that they have authority or anything else. And they certainly don't know how to use it. So I want that to change today. Now, I think most of y'all, this uh, won't be strange to you because you're familiar with it. But I want to just tell it today so it will remind us so we'll start walking in the authority. Now, the subject we're going to be studying is the authority of the believer that's available to every born-again Christian. Okay, what exactly do we have authority over? Do you know what we have authority over? Okay, we're, we need to have a very clear understanding of what comes under that authority and what doesn't come under it. So I'm going to make it real easy to remember. We have authority over Satan, sin, sickness, self, and situations. I call it the five S's. And that's how you can remember. Satan, sin, sickness, self, and situation. Okay, we're going to look at these one at a time. And it's going to be shocking uh, just uh, what, what has been made available to us. And uh, number one, we have authority over Satan. Now, Luke 10, 19 tells us that we have authority over the enemy and over all the works of the enemy. Okay, this means that we have dominion over the devil. So we're to rule over Satan. He's never supposed to rule over us. Now, so many people are so afraid of Satan. You know, they don't realize God has given us the power to rule over the enemy. Okay, number two, since we have authority over the enemy, we also have, uh, we're over the works of the enemy. That means we have authority over sin because sin is a work of the enemy. Did you know that you can say no anytime you're tempted to sin? Some people don't realize when they're really tempted, they don't realize they don't have to sin. They can say no. We don't have to do what the enemy is pulling us and tempting us to do. Okay, number three, we have authority over sickness and disease. Now, sickness and disease is the result of sin in the world, and Jesus took that as a penalty on the cross. He took every bit of that. Therefore, we now have authority over all sicknesses, and we have authority over all diseases. But you know what? You're not going to find many Christians who know that. You're not going to find many Christians that walk in that. And, but that needs to be our goal, to realize we have authority over sickness and disease, and we need to come to a place where we learn we don't have to be sick just because sickness is running rampant in the world. Number four, we have authority over anything that pertains to self. Okay, now God intends us to take authority over our time. He need, intends us to take authority over our money, our, our spending habits. We're going to be judged for that. And he intends us to take authority over our attitude. You know what? We don't have to be in a bad mood. Some people say, well, I'm just in a bad mood today. Listen, we don't have to be in a bad mood. We, we can take authority over that. God intends us to take authority over our physical body to take care of it. Over our soulish realm, our mind, our will, our emotions, we need to realize we have authority over what, what we let stay in our mind. We have authority over our will, our choices, and we have authority over our emotions. We don't have to be down and disappointed and, and discouraged. We have authority over that. We've been given authority over our flesh nature, over our appetites, over our material desires, over our sexual drive. So we need to ask ourselves, is there any one of these areas that keeps me from following God? Because I have authority over it. But is there one of them that keeps me from following God? Is there one of these areas that rules me instead of my ruling it? That's something we need to ask ourselves. Okay, now that's uh, what it talks about in Proverbs 16, verse 32. It says, the man who rules his soul or the man who rules himself is better than the man now who captures an entire city. That's a scripture, you know, in Proverbs. Well, I want you to think about that. 
we would give a medal to anyone in the service who went in and captured a city. They'd probably build a statue for him. But God told us that the man who's able to rule himself, in other words, to rule his own soul, rule what he does and what he doesn't do, is better than the man who captures an entire city. So we've been given total authority over our self-life, and God intends us now to see to it that we operate in the Word, that everything we do, we're operating in the Word. That's our responsibility. Okay, five, we've been given authority over the situations that involve us. That means the storms that come, the crisis situations, potential disasters, oppression, all these things that go, come against the people in the world. We have authority over those things. Now, if you'll remember when Jesus rebuked the storm, he turned to the disciples and he rebuked them for not taking authority uh, like they, they needed to. He intended them to take authority over all the elements. And we, we need to remind ourselves we're supposed to do that. We've been given the responsibility of taking authority over children that live in our home. And taking uh, that authority correctly, that's our responsibility to learn how to do it as parents. But it's not just taking authority ourselves, but it's teaching our children how to learn how to take authority over all these things. If we're just doing it for them and we're not teaching them, then, you know, we've missed our opportunity. Okay, we have authority over Satan, sin, sickness, self, and situations. What's left? Okay, two things we do not have authority over. Number one, we do not have authority over somebody else's will. God has given each one of us our own will, and we can do it right or we can do it wrong. It's our choice. He's given us that authority. And number two, we do, we do not have the authority to use our free will to act outside of God's will. Now, a lot of people do, but we don't have that authority. We've been give, not given that authority. Now, other than those two things, we have authority over everything on this earth. We have authority over, over everything under this earth. And we have authority over everything above this earth in the heavenlies. And yet I dare say that very few Christians are walking in that. You know, I don't, I don't know many Christians that are walking in that authority. And that's why so many Christians live under par, defeated lives so much of the time. Now, too many Christians have not trained themselves to get orders from above, and so they're just out doing their own thing. I think a lot of Christians don't even know they can get orders from above. And so they don't know anything to do except whatever it comes to their mind. If you'll remember the seven sons of Sceva in Acts 19, verse 13, they knew the mechanics of casting out a spirit, but they didn't have a relationship with the Father. And it's in knowing the one now who holds the power that's going to make this work. That's why people can go in and take authority and, and have demon spirits cast out when they know the Father, when they know the one who gives us that authority. We have to develop a personal relationship with the one who is the power. Now, when we develop that special love walk with God, and, and every Christian, should that should be our goal. Lord, I want a love walk with you. I want to be absolutely in love with you. I want to every day know you as my very, very best friend. And when we develop that special love walk, then a knowing begins to develop on the inside of us, a knowing that the word is going to work. When you have that love walk with God, you start knowing that the word's going to work. You have a knowing uh, that when you speak to demons, they will flee when you have that love walk with God. You have a knowing that God is with you, and he will never leave you, and he will never forsake you. But you're not going to have that knowing until you have that love walk developed. You have a knowing that he will be faithful to fulfill his promises. Every time you find a promise in the word of God, it's yours. It's yours. But we have to have that love walk with the Lord before we know it, before we have the confidence to walk in it. And uh, knowing that is what makes spiritual warfare work. That's what. So you've got to have that down to be able to do the spiritual warfare. Now, we're expected to use our authority to speak directly to the problem and command it to go. God's given us that authority. But often what we're doing, we're waiting on God to do it. You know, we're waiting back, well, you know, I'm waiting for God to take care of this. We're waiting for God to stop the storms. We don't even think about the fact that we have authority over that. Are we waiting for God to eliminate the problem when we're supposed to be doing that ourselves? We are supposed to be speaking directly to the circumstances in Jesus' name.
every single time. Now, so many times I've heard on the news of some God-loving, word-believing Christian who got killed in cold blood. And practically every time you'll hear it said, well, it was just his or her time to go. It was just their time to go. Listen, that's not the truth. That is not the truth. Uh, a good missionary friend of ours, he was shot at four times at close range. And the word was just pouring out of his mouth. And those bullets never hit him. Okay, what made the difference? What made the difference? Uh, we have believed for a long time that it just happens to be that person's time to go until we finally realize somebody didn't use his authority. We've been given the authority, but if we don't use it, it won't do us one bit of good. Now, fear is a huge culprit that causes people to fail to use their authority. Fear is one of the, one of the biggest enemies to our authority. And uh, I want you to hear that because if, if you want to start walking in your authority the way you need to, you're going to have to really take authority over fear, get it under your feet. Now, in a crisis, people will do one of two things. They're going, either going to get caught off guard and they're going to react in fear, or they're going to use their authority because they've practiced and they're prepared. We're going to do one of two things. And I'm, I'm sad to say that many times I'm finding more Christians that are being caught off guard and they're reacting in fear. But we need to change that. We need to change that. Things happen in the twinkling of an eye, and you're going to find out in a hurry if you've practiced your authority. Because you can't wait until something happens and then start working on your authority. You better have it down inside of you because things happen in a really big hurry. Because once the situation is there, it's too late to take time out and say, okay, uh, wait just a minute, let me, let me work on my authority. No, it's too late then. We are to get ourselves prepared in season and out of season to operate in the word and to use our authority. That needs to be a top priority. And it does take preparation. It does take practice. And uh, when we get that fear out of the way and when we say, hey, this is something I need. I need this for living and walking in this world. It won't take long to start really building yourself up in your authority. And that's what God's waiting for. He's waiting for a, a generation of Christians who will use their authority and change things around them. You know, one of Angie's good friends from college, she was living in an upstairs apartment, and some guy carried his bike up to the upstairs balcony. He knocked on her door and forced his way in to molest her. She said that fear just absolutely engulfed her, and she said she started fighting physically. She said she was kicking and biting and scratching to no avail, and then she said suddenly she came to her senses, and she thought, I'm a Christian. I have authority over this. And she started using her authority. And she said she then, as hard as she was fighting in the physical before, she started fighting in the spiritual realm. And she was able to get him out the door at some point and get the door locked. Well, he left his bike up. And when she discovered that his bicycle was on the upstairs balcony, she said she went out, threw the bike over <laughs> completely destroyed the bike, you know. But uh, I don't know whether that was God or not. But anyway, that was what she did. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, but God's power kicks in when we start using our authority. The minute we start using our authority, you'll feel God's power kick in. Now, this incident actually happened to two different friends of ours. The second friend used her authority, and she escaped. She was able to escape, and she found out. Uh, they finally caught him, and they were having his trial. And when she went, she found out that there were so many girls who had been molested, and she was the only one that had, had escaped without harm. And she said she thought, I'm the only one. And she realized she probably was the only one that used her authority, you know. <laughs> now the word works, but we have to put that word to work because using our authority can make a difference between life and death. Therefore, you know, it, it needs to become second nature that we just do it without thinking. We need to be using our authority without even letting it go through our mind. Our authority needs to come up out of our spirit and come out of our mouth without even engaging our brain. But that's not going to happen until we practice, until we know that and we start putting it to work. We're not going to use our authority in real life unless we know what the Word says and unless we come to a place where we know who we are in Christ Jesus. Now, we'll also never be ready to use our authority on something really important if we fail to practice on the little things. We need to start using our authority on little things every single day. That's our practice time. 
I want you to start noticing the first thing that comes out your mouth when a problem arises. You know, what about when your car sp sputters? Oh no, this is a fine time for this to happen. I'm gonna be late to my appointment. Isn't that what most of us, isn't that where we head? You know, uh, sadly, that's what most Christians' response is. That has to stop, but it'll never stop until we come to a place where we say, wait, I'm not going there anymore. I have authority and I'm gonna start using my authority. We came home late uh, uh, from out of town one night and it was a horrible ice storm. We had started from Austin and we were not expecting that the gas stations in all the little towns between Austin and Brownwood to be closed. They'd closed down. And the last town that we came through before Brownwood, our car registered empty, totally empty. And so Jack started praying out loud. Jack prayed in the spirit a lot, but boy, he was praying out loud that night all the way to Brownwood. And the car stopped just as we coasted into the first open station that we came to in Brownwood. We just literally coasted in. And Jack said there was no way that that car had been running on anything but fumes because he said it was on empty 30 miles before. Okay, what's the first thing out of your mouth when pain hits your body? You need to stop and be honest with yourself. When you have a pain in your body, what's the first thing that comes out of your mouth? Our spirit man needs to go to work before we even engage our brain. And it's not going to happen if we don't start practicing. But it takes practice for this to become second nature because just knowing the word now, that doesn't, doesn't automatically exempt us from harm. But having that word coming out of our mouth in faith can turn a potential disaster into a victory, and it can turn it every time. But we're going to have to practice to get there, to start doing it. Now, that word coming out of your mouth is a sword in the spiritual realm. See, we're in a battle. We're so used to physical battles. But we're in a battle in the spiritual realm a lot of the times. And we need to realize that God has given us a weapon. And the weapon is a sword. And the sword is the word of God. And it needs to be coming out of our mouth every time we face anything like that. Okay, now, before we go on, let's define what authority is. Now, authority is not power. The world's seeking after power. Okay, let me give you a dictionary definition. Authority is the delegated or the given right to give commands, to enforce obedience, to take action over Satan's sin, sickness, self, and situations. He's given that to us. And it's all backed up now with God's dunamis power. Okay, what power are we talking about? Is it our power? Okay, what physical power do we have to knock down a demon? You know, we can't even see a demon. What power do we have to ascend in the heavenlies and break up a storm? We don't have any physical power to do that, but we do have authority, and that's what God's wanting us to realize. It's all through the New Testament, and it's the power of the God of the universe that's behind our authority that makes it happen. We can't make it happen. We use our authority, and it's God's power then that makes it happen. And that's why we have to be aware of and dependent upon our, that authority and that power in order to operate in it. And it's not going to happen until we start practicing. Anything you do and you get good at it, whether it be a, a sport or anything else, you're not going to get good at it until you start practicing. Well, this is just something else. We need to start practicing because our authority would be totally useless without God's power behind it. And that's what the sons of Sceva, if you'll remember, they found out. They said the right things, but they didn't, have, they didn't have God behind them. They didn't have that relationship with God. So it's so important for us to fully understand the difference now between power and authority. Now, a lot of people think power and authority are the same. In fact, many times you'll hear people just interchange those words uh, simultaneously, but power and authority are not the same. Let me give you this example. Have you ever seen a policeman in the middle of the highway and he's directing traffic? He'll hold up his hand and the driver will bring a vehicle that weighs maybe several thousand pounds to a screeching halt. Okay, did that policeman have the power to stop that vehicle, you know, physically? Of course not. Absolutely not. It could have run right over the top of him and left nothing but a greasy spot in the middle of the road. Okay, what made that driver stop? Okay, the driver recognized the power behind that policeman's badge of authority. That's what he recognized, and so that's why he stopped. So there's a difference between power and authority. We don't have power over our circumstances. We, we don't even have pow any power over Satan. But we do have authority because it has been designated and given to us by Jesus. 
And behind the authority of the believer is a power greater than the power of the enemy. And boy, Satan knows it. Therefore, the Bible teaches that we have to learn to operate in that authority if we're going to win. It's no wonder that Satan tries to keep us ignorant. He tries to keep us ignorant that we have any kind of authority at all. And he's done a pretty good job because there's a lot of Christians that have no idea that they have any authority. And that's why he keeps us ignorant because that's the only way he's going to win. Now, a good policeman doesn't follow his own inclinations. He doesn't follow his own impulses. <coughs> a good policeman follows what he's been taught at the police academy, and he also follows the instructions that have been given to him daily by his supervisor. Okay, the same dynamics now are true of the Christian if we're going to operate in our authority successfully. The Holy Spirit is not only the power behind the authority, but he's also to be the voice directing that authority. Okay, are you realizing that? It's the Holy Spirit that's the power behind our authority, and he's also the voice in our spirit directing the authority. It's kind of like the policeman. We're not to follow our own inclinations and impulses. We're supposed to follow what we've been taught in the Word. That's our academy. And number two, uh, what we've been told daily by the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's like the policeman's supervisor. Have you ever taken authority over something and you really felt like you'd done it correctly and nothing happened? Now, this may not always be the case, but since we're supposed to be getting our instructions daily from the Holy Spirit, it's so easy for Christians to run out on their own. So we need to at least see if we've run out of, of, ahead of the Holy Spirit and if we're doing our own thing. And that's why total reliance, total dependence on Jesus like a sheep on the one hand, and then walking in our authority as a believer like the line of the tribe of Judah on the other hand, those two things are not in opposition. There's no conflict there. They work together. They have to work together. In fact, the only way we can operate correctly like a line is by relying now on the shepherd like a sheep and then listening to his instruction. Uh, if we're getting impulse from the head, Jesus then the action that we take following those impulses, following that direction, is called the authority of the believer. That's all the authority is. Now, when you do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do, you are walking in the authority of the believer. There's some Christians, and they're so afraid of that term. They think, oh, I could never walk in the authority of the believer. Listen, it's not, God didn't intend it to be hard. He just wants us to listen to the Spirit and be obedient. Walking in God's authority, God has made it really easy if we know what it is. But so many Christians are terrified when they think that they need to use their authority. I can see it on their faces sometimes when you talk about it, and they, they think, oh, I can't do that. Well, no wonder uh, they think they can't do it. Satan keeps us blinded to what we have. So today we're going to be looking at several scriptures now that will give you a really good scriptural foundation for the authority of the believer. You need to mark these later in your Bible, but in Ephesians 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. It doesn't tell us to be strong in the power that he's given to us. And it doesn't tell us to be strong in the authority that he's given to us. I want you to notice here that our strength comes from our position, where, where we're positioned. Our strength comes from where we're located. Where are we to be strong? In the Lord. We are positioned inside of Christ, and we need to remind ourselves of that every day. Lord, I am going to operate in you in your spirit this day. And when we're operating there, Satan recognizes that authority. And that's what Psalm 91 means when it says, he who dwells or lives in the shelter of the Most High. When we are living in the shelter of the Most High, uh, then we are to operate constantly from that position. That's why I really encourage you every day, say your Psalm 91 uh, scripture every day before you go out, before you meet life. Because when you say it every day, you're reminding yourself that you're living in the shelter of the Most High, and you'll start operating constantly then from that position. Now, according to Ephesians 1.20, we are literally seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That's where we're seated. That's a promise. But if we don't know that's where we're seated, we, it won't do us really that much good. We have to stop and realize every day, Lord, I am literally seated in heavenly places with you. I'm seated with you. Everything Jesus is, is available to us. 
Ephesians 1, 21 and 22 says, we are far above all rule and authority and power and dominion of the enemy. We're far above that. We are above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And God has put all things in subjection under Christ's feet and gave to him to be head over the church. But we're not through. All demon powers, every name that's named is under the feet of Jesus. But we're in him. We are located, we're operating in Christ Jesus. Therefore, it's all under our feet as well. You know, it's real easy for us to say, oh yeah, all that's under the Lord's feet. But we need to stop and realize we're in Christ Jesus. It's under our feet. Now, everything has a name. Cancer has a name. You know, poverty has a name. Impossibility is a name. And it says that Jesus is above every name. He's above the name of cancer. He's above the name of poverty. He's above the name of impossibility. With Christ, there's nothing that's impossible. If God's telling you to do it, it doesn't matter how impossible it seems. There's nothing impossible if it's something God's telling you to do. Jesus is above every name in this age and in the age to come. And according to Ephesians 2 verse 6, it says that God has raised us up with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So every evil thing is under our feet as well. But how many times do we stop and realize, Lord, there's nothing on this earth that's not under my feet as long as I'm in Christ Jesus. So are you hearing this? I mean, I want us to hear that we have the authority as long as we're positioned in the right place. Our position is all that matters if we're positioned in Christ, if we're doing it through him. Because ignorance keeps us in defeat, and there's a lot of Christians that are in defeat, but it's out of ignorance. They don't know what the word says. Several years ago, I was driving somebody else's car, and I had a flat tire. Well, they didn't have a spare, so I didn't know what to do, and I called some friends, and we went to a lot of trouble for them to come and... and uh, get me where I needed to be. Well, later I found out there was a subfloor under the carpet in the trunk, and there under the subfloor, of course, was that spare tire. And it had been there all along, the entire time that I was needing it. But what happened, it was doing me absolutely no good because I didn't know it was there. That's what's happening to so many Christians. Too many, they have the authority, it's available, but they don't know it. They don't know it's there. And so it's not doing them any good. Then there are some who believe in the authority, but they think it's something that they're going to use in the millennial kingdom age. Well, Satan's going to be bound then, you know. We're given authority to use in this life, in this world. Okay, I want us to look at some other scriptures that confirm our authority as believers. Matthew 10, 1, Jesus gave authority to his disciples over all the unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Okay, think what that's saying. He gave his disciples authority to heal any kind of disease. It doesn't matter what the disease was, any kind of sickness. Then later he called the 70 together, and he did the same thing for them. He gave them the authority. Then Matthew 16, 17 tells us that anyone who believes is going to do the same thing. Okay, are we believers? We're to do the same things. Matthew 10, 7 and 8 says, As you go preach, saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Flee freely as you have received, now freely give. But how many Christians believe that? I'm not finding many Christians that even consider this. Now, this is not limited to the disciples. It's not limited to the 70 they caught in. Those who believe include you and me, and God is not pleased when we're not walking in the authority that he's given to us. He paid a really high price for it. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I've given you authority to tread on scorpions, serpents, over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. I mean, that's enough to say, Whoa, I, I can operate like he wants me to. He's told me he's given me authority over all these things, and he's promised me none of these things are going to injure me. But do we believe that? You know, this only works when we believe it and put it to work in faith. We have been given authority, and nothing will injure us, but it doesn't do us any good if we don't know what we have, you know, if, we, if we're not believing God for it. And the only way we're going to start believing for it is when we start reading it and practicing, telling God every day, Lord, thank you. You've given me authority over all the powers of the enemy. We need to be saying that over and over until finally we believe it. And the more we believe it, we'll start operating in it. You know, that spare tire, it's locked in the trunk. 
but we can unlock the trunk. But it's up to us. We're going to have to do it. Now, when we operate in this authority, then God's power comes behind it to fulfill that which we speak in faith based on the word. Now, but just knowing that we have authority, now that's not enough. We have to come to a place where we say, okay, Lord, it says it in the word. I know it, but I've got to act on it. I've got to start walking in it. I've got to start practicing. You can know it all day long, but it doesn't do us one bit of good until we start putting it to work. And many Christians are saying, well, okay, how do we act on it? How do we act to make it happen? Well, 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, it says, Be of a sober spirit. Be on the alert because your adversary, the devil, is prowling about like a roaring lion, and he's seeking someone to devour. Now, those are not just words. Uh, that word devour means to gulp down entirely. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He is roaming around trying to find someone that he can literally gulp down entirely. And I'm going to tell you what, sadly, but I've seen a lot of Christians that have been gulped down entirely because they don't know what they have or else they know it, but they've put it aside and they're not operating in it. The ones who get gulped down entirely are the ones who don't know are the ones who have forgotten that they have authority. They're just not using it. And it's easy to forget in the face of a crisis. If you haven't trained yourself, and if you're not telling God and thanking him for it every day and, and going over your scriptures and knowing what you have, you're going to find out, yeah, you'll do fine as long as nothing bad's going on. You'll be saying, oh, yeah, I've got the authority. I know. But I'm going to tell you what, you'll forget it the first time you uh, encounter a, a crisis unless you, you're putting it to work, unless you're practicing when a person gets really good at a, uh, let's say, a sport, that means that they've practiced. They, did, they weren't automatically just good at it. I mean, they played and they got good at it and they, they practiced. It's the same way in the spiritual realm. These things are things that God has given to us, but they're not going to do us any good if we don't start using them and practicing, knowing what we've got, and put it to work. And that's why we need to operate in our authority so often that it becomes second nature. And you can operate in your authority on just little everyday things. That's the way you practice everyday things until it becomes second nature. 1 John 4.4 4 says, You are of God. You have overcome them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The greater one lives on the inside of us. We have the greater power living on the inside of us. We have Jesus living on the inside of us. But we need to remind ourselves. We need to have these scriptures written out and go over them every day until they just become second nature. James 4, 7 says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Okay, that's a simple enough, but it, it works. It's a formula. When we start submitting to God and to his word and to his, his promises, and we resist Satan with those promises then the Bible says the enemy will flee. Okay, submit. That's our dependence on God, submitting to him, listening to him like a sheep. And then he says resist like a lion. That's when we take our authority. And then the promise is that the enemy will flee. And he will. When we start using our authority, the enemy can, can just uh, growl and sound horrible until we resist him, and then he flees. Uh, I had a friend that she has been so frightened over taking her blood pressure. And uh, she called me and she was just shaking. She said, would you just stay on the line while I take my blood pressure? And I said, that's the enemy putting that fear on you. And she said, I, I don't care. I'm just so fearful of it. I'm just so fearful. And I said, okay, well, let's start... Uh, uh, talking about what God has given to you. He's given you power. He's given you authority. And we started talking about it. And uh, then uh, I said, okay, when you start to take your blood pressure, I'll, for a while, I'll call you and uh, we'll pray over it while you're doing that. Well, I started to call her and she called me and she was almost shouting. She said, I took authority over it and I don't have any fear. The fear just fled away. I said, it's because it was a spirit. It was a demon spirit. And so when you start using your authority, it tells us the demon spirit will leave. And that's exactly what happened. And I see this happening so many times. People will be so fearful. But when they start in faith, just using their authority, then pretty soon the fear's gone and they, they can't understand how they could have been so fearful and no longer fearful. It's because it's a demon spirit. That, that fear is a demon spirit. And when you use your authority, the demon leaves and then the, the fear's gone. Submission to God and resistance to the enemy, they go hand in hand. 
I'm going to say that again because I, I want you to hear it. When we submit to God and we resist the enemy with the word, then it, it's like it's vertical and it's horizontal. And it works. And that, that demon spirit of fear will leave. And when the spirit of fear is gone, it's so much. It's just easy to operate in the word. Now, notice all these scriptures on authority. Uh, it's not just one isolated scripture. It's written by all the apostles all through the New Testament. If he put it that many times, all the writers of the New Testament, they wrote about our authority. And they didn't say, pray to God and ask him to do it. All through the New Testament, we see that. What, one author after another author. Evidently, God wanted us to hear that, you know. Now, it's an automatic assumption that the prayer time has already been put into it. I mean, we need to have a, a love walk with God. We need to be, just have this intimate love walk with Jesus that you have every morning. And then you'll start getting your instructions, and you'll, you'll see yourself start doing things that you never dreamed you'd be able to do in the kingdom. And then they all say, after that scripture tells you to get right with God, then every one of them says, you resist the enemy. And we resist with our delegated authority. A number of years ago, uh, when I was in college, so it's been a few years ago. But anyway, uh, uh, I had this Bible professor, and he made this statement, and it was so off the wall that I wrote it down. He said, I will never teach on Christians having authority. He said, the Bible says that we're to be humble. And if I said I had authority, he said, that would be prideful. I don't have any pride. I don't have any authority. I just trust God. It wasn't long after that. He was in his prime. It wasn't long after that he got cancer and died. And I thought, honey, you didn't use your authority. You know, we have authority over sicknesses and diseases, but we've got to use that authority. We've got to practice and use it. Now, Satan is a liar and he's a deceiver, and he does everything he can to keep Christians from knowing, from knowing about their authority. Ephesians 4.27 says, Do not give the devil an opportunity. You, you're the understood subject of that sentence. And when symptoms come on a, 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 a person, maybe they get symptoms on their body or maybe they get a really bad doctor report, most Christians think, well, that's final. You know, uh, I, I, I was believing, but boy, I went to the doctor and it showed up in the records. It showed up in all the tests they took. I, I've got this. There's nothing I can do about it. Listen, it's not over at that point, not when we get a re report from the doctor. Uh, that all that is is Satan's report. That doctor may be a very honest doctor, and he may be telling you things that he's seen. They're true in the natural, but we have authority over the natural. And it's time then when we get a if a person gets a bad report, it's time then for that person to get busy and use God's uh, authority. Repent. And just say, God, I am sorry. If I've opened the door, I'm sorry. But, Lord, your word tells me something different than what this report's telling me. And I'm believing your word. And I've known so many people who have done that, and they've gotten well, even though they'd gotten a bad report. So a bad report from the doctor, that's not final. The, the, the doctor's report's not final. It's what God's word says that's final. You're the one who's being told not to give the devil an opportunity. And sometimes it can look, you know, it's overwhelming when we realize that we're the one who gives Satan permission. And the way we give him permission, you know, we hear a bad report and we start saying, oh, no, I can't believe this happened to me. That's the last thing we need to do. Something needs to rise up on the inside of us and we say, that report doesn't line up with God's report. Whose report am I going to believe? We need to realize that he can only stay in areas of our life where we give him permission. That's the only place where Satan can stay. Colossians 1.13 says, We have been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and delivered over into the kingdom of light. Now, it sounds backwards that we become dependent upon somebody else. When we know our authority, because it's the opposite with the world. When the world comes into its worldly authority, it becomes self-confident, you know, self-sufficient, self-reliant. But in the kingdom of God, the more we understand our position, the more we understand our authority, the more confident we become in God's sufficiency, Christ's sufficiency. And that's when we quit giving the enemy permission, no matter where that, uh, the report came from.
We're living in the day and age when we're going to have to take authority over our finances and over sickness and over all the powers of darkness because we're living in a different age now. I believe we've come to almost the end of the end times. And so it's going to be harder now. But we have everything we need to be able to be victorious even in these end days. And we're going to find out the ways of the world that once worked. They're crumbling under our feet. Fear is running rampant. I, I see as many Christians in terif terrifying fear as I do non-Christians now. And it just means we're going to have to grab hold of God's promises and we're going to have to start taking authority over spirits of lack, spirits of, of poverty, spirits of disease. And we're going to have to use the name of Jesus and believe it and put it to work. But we're going to have to do our part. We're going to have to believe the word. We're going to have to practice the word, obey the word, and then learn how to take authority. And a lot of Christians are believing the word, but they stop and they don't take authority. Well, they, they've cut off the end. It's not, going to, it's not going to help them that much. Jesus said in John, the things I do, you're going to do greater things. I remember the first time I read that, I thought that has to be a misprint. We're going to do greater things than the things that Jesus did, you know. And I, I just looked at that and looked at it. But we need to take that seriously. Our kids, our kids learned early on that Jesus uh, uh, was really real to Jack, and he took it seriously, what the Word said. Once when the city was hiding their children under mattresses and in bathtubs to protect them from a tornado that had already been sighted on the ground in Brownwood, Jack got the kids out of the bed in their pajamas. He had them go outside with their Bibles, and they, he had them start speaking the Word of God directly to the tornado. We could see the tornado on the ground from our front door. And we started walking around the house declaring that there was a blood covering over our property and commanding that tornado to disappear in Jesus' name. And Jack kept having those kids say it out loud. He'd make them get louder, you know, say it louder. Well, finally, Jack got peace, and we went back in the house just in time to hear the announcer over the radio said, we have just witnessed a miracle, and they used the word miracle. That's what shocked us. We've just witnessed a miracle. That tornado has suddenly zipped back into the clouds. Now, the men were in uh, their vehicle down on the road. We could see their vehicle down below our house, and they were broadcasting loud. Loud. They probably were loud. But anyway, they were broadcasting live <laughs> as they watched that tornado. Now, Jack took uh, the authority that we had been given. He took it very seriously, but he was determined that the kids were going to do it. Uh, he knew he could, but we're to teach our children. And uh, he could have gone out there alone, but he wanted those kids to take their authority seriously. Now, I'll tell you something humorous that happened. Angie went to class. She was at Howard Pine that year, and she went to class the next day. And the professor was leaning against the desk, and he was asking all the students, what were you doing when the tornado was on the ground last night? Well, some of them were in the shower stall in their uh, dorm room, and some of them had pulled their mattress over the top of them. Two of them had actually found storm cellars. And when he came to Angie, she said she thought, do I do it or don't? <laughs> do <I not? laughs> and so she said, well, my dad had us outside with our Bibles taking authority and speaking to the storm. And she said it was so funny. The professor didn't say a word. He, he just picked up his uh, textbook, and he said, okay, let's all turn to page so-and-so. <laughs> He wasn't going to approach that, you know. And I thought, well, that's kind of sad because this is a Christian college. <laughs> he should be teaching them how to do it. But you have authority over sin, John 20, 23. And this scripture blew me away when I found it. John 20, 23, the sins you forgive will be forgiven. The sins you retain will be retained. Jesus is telling us that we have authority to forgive sins directed by the Holy Spirit. You can take authority over spirits that cause people to be drawn to steal or, or to lie if it involves you. You know, years ago when we had the church, purses and Bibles were being taken uh, at our church. and Everybody uh, was saying, boy, you better hang on to your purse. Mine got stolen last night. Well, we finally figured out who we thought had been taking them. So Angie asked the owner of this girl's apartment if she could go, if, she would, if they would take her into her apartment for her just to see if. And sure enough, when they got in, there was a big pile of Bibles and purses in the bedroom. You know, uh, now uh, our, our uh, prophet Jacob was there, and he was preaching that night. He didn't know any of this was going on, and he was preaching that night, 
And at the end, you know how people go up and they get prophecies. Well, uh, he was just giving these nice prophecies, you know, one right after another, right after another. And so this girl, we had her go up with us. And uh, he came to her, and, and she was a cute girl, you know. And all of a sudden, he said, in the name of Jesus, you spirit of lying, come out of her. And you spirit of stealing, come out of her. Well, I mean, my, my heart just froze because I thought, oh, my goodness. I knew it, but he didn't know it, you know. And I thought, you know, but she made a profession of faith. She received the Lord, and, and she got set free. So it ended good. Another time, our car was stolen out from under the carport, and Jack had to go to work every day then, and uh, our two children had, were in two different schools, and so one car just wasn't going to work. Well, the sheriff was not very encouraging. After a week, he told us we could be sure that our car was already down in Mexico with a new paint job. Well, Jack just kept taking authority over that demon spirit of stealing, and he kept commanding Satan to release the car. Well, finally, he felt like God impressed him to forgive whoever it was that took the car. And he said he thought that was interesting, but he started forgiving whoever it was. And what I'm going to tell you next, it's hard to believe, but it's the truth. Another week went by, and one day the sheriff brought a guy out to our house, and the guy told us, he said, I've stolen all of my life, but I wanted to come out. I took your car, and I wanted to come out and apologize. And... Um, He's, and Jack said, Are you want to come out and apologize? He said, yes, I've never felt guilty before, and I don't like the way it feels. And we wondered if that had to do with the fact that God was telling us to pray for his forgiveness. If maybe that freed his spirit. We wondered about that. But anyway, Jack brought the guy into the house, and they talked for a good while, and he led him to the Lord. And uh, then uh, after he finished, uh, Jack said, well, the sheriff brought you out here. Where, where's my car? You know, and he said, I was so drunk that night. He said, I can't remember where I left it. He said, I think I remembered being at a rodeo, but I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> we really started praying, but we knew God wouldn't have gone that, you know, gone to that much trouble uh, to let him come and repent and not get the car back. But it was kind of strange. And uh, we knew we had not had a rodeo in Brownwood. So Angie and a friend started calling around, and they found out that they had had a rodeo in one of the little towns uh, outside of Brownwood. Well, when they drove over there, there was our car in the rodeo parking lot. It had been there ever since the rodeo. Now, we as Christians must learn to take authority over the enemy and not just accept whatever he dishes out, because the more you accept, the more the enemy is going to dish out. And sometimes it's important to bind spirits off of a person so they can hear their own conscience, you know. And you can take authority over spirits of rebellion and self-will and, and mind-binding spirits. Whatever you see operating in your children, I can't emphasize this enough, take authority over it so that your child will be free to be able to obey God. A lot of kids that are in rebellion, it's because they've got that spirit over them. And if, if you start taking authority over that spirit and they get free, then they can make right decisions. And it's so important to get them in agreement as you pray. Jack would always bring the kids in when he was taking authority. He would bring them in and have them take authority with him, you know. And uh, I, that was teaching them so that when they were on their own, they'd be able to do it. Uh, there was a lady in our church. Her husband worked at Howard Payne. A lot of you would know her. She had a stroke, and they said uh, her brain was dead, and the monitors were sh was showing a flat line. Well, Jack was called to the hospital, and he was told that they were just keeping her alive until her son, who was out of state, could get back. So Angie and uh, uh, Jack, they were in the ICU room and they decided okay we're still going to pray and take authority over that spirit of death and still we're going to still call life back into her body and Angie was sitting in a chair beside the bed and she noticed that Marlene swallowed and she said dad if somebody's brain dead can you swallow <laughs> both of them thought well I didn't know that could happen and so they finally left I mean she was lying there just totally unconscious I mean nothing was showing on the monitor and before the night was over, Marlene woke up. She asked for food. She was back in church the next Sunday. I mean, I, I don't think we have any idea what's available to us if we ever decided, I'm going to use the word. I'm going to believe the word 100% just like it says it. But we're so used to the world. The world's pulling us away from the word. 
constantly, and we're going to have to stand up and be determined, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust your word. I would love to tell you that I had done that so well. I didn't. It was Jack, but I learned a lot from him. <coughs> but it's amazing the authority that we as Christians have that we do not use. I read a story written by a well-known evangelist. Uh, he had a diabetic friend traveling with him, and the, the guy had had to take insulin uh, shots every morning. But the entire time that he was traveling with this evangelist, he never took a shot. And every time they checked his blood sugar, it was normal. But a week after he got home, he called this evangelist, and he said, the second day after getting home, I started having to take my insulin shots again. Well, the, the evangelist explained that while he had been with him on the trip, that he had been the one taking authority over the infirmity for him. But he said, you're home now, and you're going to have to learn to take your own authority. And uh, uh, that made such an impression on me because I thought, okay, if somebody else can do it and get the results, then we can do that too, you know. We've all been in training. We've, we've got to start learning how important it is to grow up spiritually and begin taking authority for ourselves over these things. John 10, 17 and 18, Jesus was speaking here. And he said, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay my life uh, that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. And the Bible tells us, as he is in this world, so are we to be. Now, some people have a really hard time with the idea that we have authority over life and death. But Jesus had authority over his life, and he had authority over his death, and then he turned that over to us. He chose to die for us, and he turned all that authority over to us. And we now have authority over our lives and even over our death. And we don't have to die until uh, God either says it's time to go home, uh, if, if we'll use the authority that we have. Now, I thank God that Jack knew his authority. While I was in the Philippines, uh, I was attacked with a disease that caused people to bleed internally. And Jack started noticing that I was incoherent, and uh, we finally discovered that my brain was bleeding. Well, by that time, I couldn't make any sense when I talked, couldn't uh, think coherently, and the doctor was insistent that I be flown by helicopter uh, to San Angelo, and he had a doctor on standby. But God told Jack, no, you drive her because I want you to pray over her all the way. Well, he had to override the doctor because the doctor said, I don't think she'll make it if you, if you try to drive her. And Jack said, I don't care. I feel like God told me. Well, it's interesting that even though I couldn't think with any clarity, down in my spirit, everything was clear. And God was very clearly speaking to me. And he said, uh, he asked me if I believed what I was teaching out of Psalm 91. He very clearly asked me that. And I remember knowing that I had a covenant promise, and deep inside I was arguing with death, and I was insisting my covenant is real. My covenant will work. Now, I couldn't articulate anything, couldn't think uh, uh, cohensively. I couldn't do that. But deep inside, I was choosing to believe my covenant. Now, the doctor was on standby. He was ready as soon as we got there. And... Uh, so they were taking me through all the tests before the, uh, the surgery, and the bleeding stopped before the examination was completed, and I was home the next day. Now, that, those kinds of things don't happen unless you've got somebody praying. You know, Jack was praying, and God had told him, attacks are going to come, but then it's up to you and it's up to me to use our authority. If we, if we want to change the situation. And there's times when you'll be standing for somebody else, just like Jack was standing for me. And you're going to realize that one of the biggest hindrances is fear. And you're going to find that when you face something, every time fear is going to be the, one of the first things that presents itself to you. So you're going to have to deal with that fear first and then go into your authority. And that's why it's so important to refuse that demon of fear because fear stops the faith every time. It is many times hard to win after attack starts if we haven't done our homework ahead of time. So we can't say, okay, I, if, if anything ever happens, I'm going to put this to work. No, that won't do any good. We have to put it to work and get used to it, start operating in it, start, start using it every day. And once we start training ourselves in our authority, get that settled inside of us ahead of time, then if something approaches us, 
We just use our authority. We're used to it, and it's easy. And a lot of times, if you're practicing every day, the enemy leaves you alone anyway. But if you'll put some effort into meditating on these scriptures and keep them coming out of your mouth and, and getting your love walk established, none of this really works without your love walk until you're in, in a love walk with the Lord. But if you'll start doing that, you'll not be able to believe the victories that you'll start seeing happening. And it's so worth the effort that you put into learning how to walk in God's authority. It works, but we have to be the one to put it to work, and we have to be the one to start practicing ahead of time and training ourselves. If you want to be in a, pen, a pianist or a good football player or whatever, you're going to have to start practicing ahead of time to get there. And it's the same way with this. We need to practice what God has told us to do, and we'll find out then when and if that time comes, we're prepared. We, we, we've already trained our, God has trained us through our practice and we'll start seeing victories. Father, I thank you for the authority that you've given to us as believers. Oh God, I ask you to forgive us for the, the hundreds of times that we fail to use it when it's there. It's a gift. It's an unbelievable gift. Forgive us when we haven't used it. But Father, I pray that you'll help each one of us to come to a place where we make a decision and we say from this moment forth, I'm going to operate in my authority, and I'm not going to wait until the enemy hits. I, I'm going to practice, and, and I'm going to start reading my scriptures and confessing those scriptures, and I'm going to start putting this to work so that if and when an attack comes, I'll be prepared. I'll be ready. I thank you for that, Father. Father, I thank you. This room is full of people who have faith, they love you, and they want to make a difference in the world. So, Father, I thank you that you will deal with each one of us in this room, that we will decide that we are going to learn how to walk in our authority. We're going to learn how to put this to work because it, oh, God, it's such a gift. It is such a gift. And we just want to say thank you, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.